Good morning. Good morning. It's nice to see all of you here. I have one um, note from Peg Eckenbarger. Pastor Brian and I were able to go see her this past week, and she looks fabulous. My dear church family, thank you so much for your cards, calls, and well wishes. It's always comforting to know someone is thinking of you when it's needed. May God shine his grace upon you and around you. With love, yours in Christ, Peg. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to uh, Second Congregational Church here in West Stafford. Glad to have you all here on this fourth Sunday of, of uh, Easter. It's also Good Shepherd Sunday. And you'll understand why when you hear the scriptures uh, for this morning. I'm not trying to be cool. <laughs> I've just joined the ranks of people like Roy Orbison and Stan Lee. All the other people who had glaucoma and became very light sensitive. So uh, that's why I have these. And it's the curse of having blue eyes. <laughs> you become light sensitive. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Let us now listen to the prelude as we center ourselves for worship.
salvation, as it is printed in the bulletin. Let us pray. Gracious and forgiving Lord, gentle shepherd and merciful God, be present with us and lead us in holiness and righteousness. Bless us with your word, your truth, and with your spirit of peace, that we may worship you not only with our words and our thoughts, but also with our hearts, and when we rise to lead with all our actions. Most loving God, accept the praise we bring and help us dedicate ourselves completely to you. We pray in the name of Jesus and continue in prayer as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint any head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. See, we can do that, come that close to each other, because we live in the same house. <laughs> The Gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John. It may be helpful to read this passage and then to read Ezekiel 34 immediately after. There seems little doubt that Jesus made that Old Testament passage the basis for his ministry. There are numerous other Old Testament references to the way God is like the shepherds of biblical times and how they guided, cared for, and rescued Israel, who were the sheep of his flock. One of the enduring images of Jesus is that of the Good Shepherd. The startling different aspect of this passage is the willingness of the shepherd to lay down his life for the sheep. So we hear these words now from John's Gospel, chapter 10 verses 11 through 18. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. 
The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep sees the wolf and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because the hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. And I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. God, we thank you for the blessing of reading your word together. We ask that these words of life, truth, and hope would continue to impact us in the week ahead. Please pray with me. Holy God, we pray that you will let your word continue to go forth from the altar of this church, resulting in healing and deliverance in all our services throughout all the years. Amen. When Jesus uses word pictures like parables, metaphors, or other figures of speech, he often represents God as someone who is a bit eccentric. In the parable of the sower, for example, the sower throws seeds everywhere, not just on the good soil. In the parable of the unforgiving servant, the king forgives a debt of 10,000 talents. <clears throat> which is just a huge amount of money. In the parable of the vineyard, the owner pays everyone the same wages, regardless of how long they worked. In the parable of the wicked tenants, the landowner sent his own son to collect the rent from tenants who had already killed his servants. These are just a few of the eccentric characters <clears throat> who represent God in the parables of Jesus. And today, we heard Jesus describe himself as the Good Shepherd. We are so used to hearing about Jesus as the Good Shepherd that we don't really examine what Good Shepherd Jesus said about himself or about us. When we listen more close, we discover that Good Shepherd Jesus is a very eccentric shepherd. Now the original Greek that John's Gospel was written in has more than one word that translates into good in English. One word means competent, professional, skilled, that kind of thing. The other word means noble, heroic, excellent, and things like that. When Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd, he means that he is the excellent, noble, and heroic shepherd. He's not merely competent and professional. This noble, heroic, and excellent shepherd would seem pretty eccentric to the average shepherd in the first century in Israel. Shepherds in the first century were not raising flocks of beloved souls. They exploited the sheep. They used the sheep primarily for wool, for mutton, and for sacrifices. The reason they watched over the sheep was not because they loved the sheep, but because the sheep 
were their source of income. Shepherds have always defended their flocks from predators, but they don't do it because they love the sheep. They kill or drive off the predators because they want to provide for their families. A shepherd might get killed by a predator, but it is an accident. And he does not go down without fight. He most certainly does not willingly lay down his life for the sheep. We just heard Jesus describe himself as the good shepherd. The noble, <coughs> heroic shepherd. He said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lies da lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus described himself as a shepherd who loves his sheep by willingly surrendering his life for them. This sets Jesus apart from all the other shepherds of that time. We can place all the religions of the world into two categories. Some religions teach self-salvation. You must do something in order to provide all or part of your own salvation. And there are a wide variety of activities in these religions. Meditation, quest, Self-punishment, fasting, right thinking, right talking, self-improvement, moral character, and on and on and on. They all boil down to you saving yourself. Now in our religion, in Christianity, it is the only religion where God takes on human flesh and then declares that he will surrender his life in order to save his creation. It is good that Jesus loves his sheep and surrenders his life for them. For we are the sheep that he speaks of in his figure, in this figure of speech. And we have powerful enemies. Jesus speaks in this uh, part of John's Gospel of the wolf. Now, I don't care how much time a sheep spends in the weight room or at the martial arts dojo. He's not going to be able to take on a wolf. If the sheep tries to defend itself, the wolf will have an easy lunch. The wolves that come after us are sin and death and Satan. Every time we make ourselves more important than God, Anytime our feelings are more important than God's word. Anytime we exploit our neighbor instead of loving him. Anytime we refuse to forgive. Anytime we listen to gossip. Anytime we murder with thoughts of hate. Anytime we want our way instead of God's way. Anytime we rationalize sin. These are the ways that we open the door to sin and allow death and the devil to be. It is as the Apostle Paul told the church in Rome. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because of all, all have sinned, Death is one thing that we have in common with everyone. 
Jesus said. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And with these words, Jesus illustrates the value of some false religions. As far as some of the religions of this world are concerned, when death comes, you're on your own. If there is a belief in an afterlife, then it teaches that you're judged by your own merit and your worthiness, who you are and what you have done. And if you failed in this life, well, too bad. The good shepherd Jesus, on the other hand, fought with sin. He fought with death and won. And he fought with Satan. And he did it in a most unusual way. First and foremost, Jesus became one of the sheep. That's what Christmas is all about. Jesus in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes. Whoever heard of a shepherd becoming one of the sheep in order to save the sheep. But nevertheless, the Good Shepherd became one of us in order to battle sin, death, and the devil. And when the time came for Jesus to battle death, he even gave death the home field advantage. He suffered and died on a cross. And as he hung on the cross, Jesus endured the eternal punishment that our sins deserve. And instead of leaving us to face the wolf of death by ourselves, he faced death for us. He faced the death of this world and the eternal death of hell. The Good Shepherd faced all this so that we can be the sheep in his eternal flock. So there is a special message for us in the gospel we just heard. Jesus said, I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice so that there will be one flock, one shepherd. Since Jesus said these words to the Jews who were listening to him at the time, these words inform them that Jesus has sheep that aren't part of the Jewish flock. That means that we Gentiles are also sheep of his flock. The entire flock is the Christian church that had all God's people. This means that the Good Shepherd laid down his life for all people, in all times, and in all places. Jesus is for everyone. And the resurrection of Jesus is the promise for our last days on this earth. The day will come when the wolf comes for you and for me, but will not stay dead. Instead, the Good Shepherd will come and come on the last day and bring us all back to life. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will burn, will be burned up and dissolved 
then there will be new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. That's from the second letter of Peter. All of you who believe will come together as one flock. We will share in the joy of eternal bliss. We will share in all the blessings that the Good Shepherd earned for us when he laid down his life for his flock. And then we will live together with him where there will be one flock and one shepherd. Amen. The hymn is Savior Like a Shepherd Lead Us, number 252. Thank you that when we wander off, you seek us. That when we stumble and fall, you lift us up. That when we falter or begin to get lost, you call us by name. Help us, dear Lord, to remain close by you. To keep your presence before our eyes and to hold your word within our hearts. Loving God and giving God, you provide all that we need and protect us from all that seeks to destroy us. We know that we are safe in your care. And we find rest in you. We renew our strength in you and we thank you. We pray to you now at this time for the others who need your presence in their lives. 
pray, O oh God, for those who are in authority and who are elected to positions of power. We ask your wisdom. We pray for those who lead either by right of birth or personality or by office. We ask a heart of love and acceptance. We pray for those who have suffered for so long and who now face the awesome responsibility that comes with freedom. We ask a justice that is full of mercy. We thank you that justice can still be found within our own borders. And may the events of this past week lead to reform, to re-education, and an awakening and acknowledgement of true equality among all races. We also hold before you this day those who were named before you in our time of sharing. Grant unto all these we have named and to all your church new life in the name of Christ. Make us a peaceful and joyful people who live the love we have received from your hands. We ask all these things through Jesus, the Good Shepherd. Amen. This time in the service we receive our offering, but unfortunately, still not cleared to pass the basket around, still not safe to do that. So we do have a basket on the back table. If you have not dropped a donation in there on your way in, please do so on your way out. Like a shepherd tending to those in their care, God has offered us rest and renewal, protection and mercy, love and nourishment. In response, we are invited to give a portion of our time, our energy, gifts, and prayers so that others in this world may experience the same. The morning offering is now received.
praying that through them and through every effort of our hearts and hands that your work in this world may be done and that your name may be glorified today and as always. Amen. Closing hymn is Praise the Lord, His Glory Show. Number 19 in your inserts, and we'll sing verses 1 through 3.